Section 5.2, the definite integral. If f is a function defined for x between a and b, we divide the interval a, b into n subintervals of equal width delta x, where delta x is equal to b minus a over n. We then let uh, x0 equal a, x1, x2, all the way through xn equals b, be the endpoints of these subintervals, and we let x1 star, x2 star, all the way up to xn star, be any sample points inside these subintervals. So the xi star lies in the ith subinterval from xi minus 1 to xi. Then the definite integral of f from a to b is the integral from a to b of f of x dx, and it is defined as the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n of f of x i star delta x, provided that this limit exists and gives the same value for all possible choices of sample points. If it does exist, we say that f is integrable on a, b. This uh, symbol is called an integral sign. In the notation um, integral from a to b of f of x dx, f of x is called the integrand, so that's the integrand. A and b are called the limits of integration, so that's the lower limit of integration, upper limit of integration. And the procedure of calculating integral is called integration. The sum f of x i star times delta x from i equals 1 to n is called a Riemann sum, and it can be used to approximate the definite integral of an integrable function within any desired degree of accuracy. So this looks kind of like this. We have our interval going from a to b. We have delta x as the width of each of the intervals that we're looking at. And then we have these sample points x i star. They could be taken on the right side of each interval, in which case we would have a right Riemann sum, or on the left side, or they could be in the midpoint, or they could be anywhere else inside of the interval. The sample points can be taken anywhere, and each choice of sample point gives us a different kind of approximation. We might be a little bit under in this case, or we might be a little bit over. And when you take the limit, these little gaps between the actual area underneath the curve and the area that we're calculating will completely disappear and leave you with a nice, smooth, exact area underneath the curve. Because when we take the limit, the number of rectangles we throw in here is so many that any kind of difference between the actual area under the curve and the approximation becomes completely negligible. Because we're basically looking at the number of rectangles going towards infinity becoming arbitrarily large. We define our integral using sample points instead of left or right endpoints because the idea here is that no matter where we choose the sample points, it doesn't matter. We take our limit, the choice of sample points becomes irrelevant. So that means that if we are doing our integral, we can just make a choice of sample point and it shouldn't make any difference. We can interpret a definite integral as a net area that is, a difference of areas, where the integral from a to b of f of x dx is some area 1 minus some area 2. Area 1 is the region above the x-axis and below the graph of x, and area 2 is the area of the region below the x-axis and above the graph of f. So this is an area 1, this is another part of area 1, and then over here would be area 2, below. If you take all of the area 1 pieces and you subtract the area 2 pieces, then you get a net area or a signed area. Over here is what it looks like for our Riemann sum. And then over here is what it looks like when you take the limit and it becomes the integral. If f is continuous on the uh, interval from a to b, or if f only has a finite number of jump discontinuities, then f is integrable on this interval a, b. That is the definite integral uh, where the integral from a to b of f of x dx exists. So then we have another theorem. If f is integrable on the closed interval a, b, then the integral is equal to the limit of f of x i, of the sum of f of x i delta x, 
where these are right sample points. So for this limit, each of the delta x's is the same as before. It's the width of the entire interval divided by how many rectangles you have. And in this case, each of the xi's starts with a, but then adds i delta x. So that means that the first one, x1, would be whatever a is plus delta x. So you would start not at a, but you would start over there for x1. This is assuming that we're doing a right Riemann sum though. So this is for right sample points. Like we said, the integral is the same no matter which sample points you choose, at least according to this theorem. So it shouldn't matter if we choose uh, right sample points to compute it. However, if we wanted to express our integral in terms of left sample points, what we could do is we could change our Riemann sum. Instead of starting at one, we could start at zero because that way we start at a on the left. So we could start at zero and then instead of going all the way up to n, we would go up to n minus one. So we'd start over here at a and we would end over here and that would be a left Riemann sum. We'd keep f of xi delta x in there. So we'd be using all the left sample points, left endpoints as sample points. So that would be for the left. However, that's not the only way that you can change a Riemann sum. We could have left our indices going from i equals one to n, provided that we change the way that we define xi. So instead of um, changing our Riemann sum to get the change in left-right approximation, what we can do is we can change xi we make it so that it's um, counting a little bit earlier. So how about we make it a plus i minus one times delta x. That's pretty much the exact same thing as changing the indices over here. Now, instead of starting at x one, when we plug in i equals one, we start at x zero. So this would give you a left Riemann sum and this would give you a right one even without changing the indices. Similarly, what we could do is we could make it, um, how about, so this would be xi equal to a plus i delta x plus, or how about minus um, delta x over two. Then in this case, we're starting out with a right Riemann sum but then we go backwards half of a delta x. So that makes now the sample points at the midpoint. Similarly, if we were starting out with a left Riemann sum, what we could do is we could take a plus i delta x and we could, or sorry, a minus, a plus i minus one delta x, and we could add delta x over two. And that would push it from the left over to the right just halfway enough to get us a midpoint sample point. So we have a lot of different ways that we can manipulate these Riemann sums and the way that we define the um, xi's so that we can plug in different sample points. In the end though, when we take the limit, none of it will actually matter because as we take more and more rectangles, they will all approach this nice smooth either area or net area or signed area. So let's do an example and express the uh, limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals one to n of xi cubed plus xi sine xi delta x as an integral on the interval from zero to pi. So we have f of xi equal to xi cubed plus xi sine of xi. So that implies that f of x is equal to x cubed plus x sine x when we convert it. We also know that our interval is from zero to pi, so a equals zero and b equals pi. So now we can write that our limit of our sum 
of xi cubed plus xi sine xi delta x is equal to the integral from 0 to pi of x cubed plus x sine x delta x. In order to compute um, limits of Riemann sums, we need to be able to plug in sometimes formulas for different sums that come up. We proved this formula in the previous um, section using induction. The rest of them can, so some of them are easier to prove than others. Uh, a lot of them you can use induction for. We're not going to prove the rest of them. We're just going to take them for granted at this point. But it's good to be able to have a formula for the sum of the first i integers, some of the first i squared, some of the first cubes, and so on. It's also good to be able to pull constants out. So over here, in either case, basically, this that's what it's doing, is that it's pulling constant out. Once you do that, over here you have 1 added up n times, so it makes sense it's n times the constant. And then over here, we just uh, have some thing that depends on i, but pulling out the constant allows us to deal with that all by itself. And over here we see that the sum of two um, sequences, basically, is the same as splitting the sum. And same thing with the difference. Let's evaluate the Riemann sum for f of x equals x cubed minus 6x, taking the sample points to be right endpoints, where a equals 0, b equals 3, and n equals 6. So let's calculate delta x, our width. Well, that's b minus a over n. So that's 3 minus 0 over 6, which is a half. So the width of each of these subintervals is a half. We start on the right, so we don't start at 0. We start at half. So x1 will be half. x2 is 1. x3 is 1.5. x4 is 2 x5 is 2.5, and x6 is the last one, 3, which is b. So we're trying to get a right Riemann sum. So that would be r6. So that's the sum from i equals 1 to 6 of f of x i delta x. So it's the y value, the height of the rectangle, which is f of 0.5 times delta x plus f of 1 times delta x plus f of 1.5 times delta x plus f of 2 times delta x plus f of 2.5 times delta x plus f of 3 times delta x. And all together, that becomes half, which is delta x. And we can factor out that half. So we get half times all of the y values, negative 2.875 minus 5 minus 5.625 minus 4 plus 0.625 plus 9. So that becomes negative. 3.9375. And in this case, because it's negative, we cannot interpret it as an area. We have to interpret it as a net area. Let's try to evaluate this integral now. To evaluate the integral, we're going to have to take the limit of a Riemann sum as n goes to infinity, so we can't just stop at 6. So let's calculate delta x now going to be b minus a over n, where n stays n, but we still go from 0 to 3. So this becomes 3 over n. So now we're going to start x0 at 0, x1 
that is the right endpoint. So that starts at 0 plus 1 times delta x. So that's 3 over n. It's one width away. x2 then is another width away, so it's 6 over n. x3 is 9 over n, and so on. This tells us that in general, an arbitrary xi will equal 3 times i over n, because that's the pattern, the relationship between the index and um, the numerator. Let's plug this into our integral now. We see that the integral from 0 to 3 of x cubed minus 6x delta x is equal to, by definition, the limit of the Riemann sum i equals 1 to n f of x i delta x. And we said that that's the limit of the sum of 3i over n because that's what we said, I'm sorry, f of 3i over n because that's what we said xi was. And then delta x we said is 3 over n. So we can write this as the limit of the sum. Mm, actually, what we can do at this point, we have f of 3i over n times 3 over n, but this is summing from i equals 1 to n. So as far as the sum is concerned, 3 over n has no i in it, it is a constant. So I can pull out that 3 over n. And then inside, what I have left is my sum from i equals 1 to n. And I can now evaluate f of 3i over n. We know that f, in this case, is x cubed minus 6x. So that's 3i over n cubed minus 6 times 3i over n. And that is the limit of 3 over n times the sum of 27 over n cubed times i cubed minus 18 over n i by just moving the cube down and distributing. So we keep trying to simplify this. We get that this is the limit of, well, again, now we have some stuff that has no relationship to i. So we can pull that out. We get 81 over n to the fourth times the sum from i equals 1 to n of i cubed minus 54 over n squared times the sum from i equals 1 to n of i. Because remember, if you have the sum of a difference, it's the exact same thing as a difference of sums. You can split it. Let's go further. This is then the limit of 81 over n to the fourth times what the sum of the first n cubed numbers are. Well, we have to go back to our formula list. We see that that's this, and the sum of the first i numbers is that. So we go back and plug those in. So it's n times n plus 1 over 2 squared minus 54 over n squared times n times n plus 1 over 2. Okay, so we're making progress. We now only have a limit. We don't have any sums. So if we can just figure out a way to compute this limit, we should be good. 
So we have 81 over n to the fourth. Over here, it looks like it would be great if we could cancel out this n to the fourth. So how about we factor out an n from over here, and that way we have n squared, because when we square that again, we'll get n to the fourth. So we can rewrite this as n squared times one plus one over n over two. And over here, we can do the exact same trick. And that way, we'll cancel out this n squared in the denominator. So we factor out n squared. And we get that this is the limit of 81 over 4. Because when we, can't, when we factor out n squared and then we square it, we get n to the fourth in the top, so it cancels. So we get 81 over 4 because this 2 squared becomes 4. And we have 1 plus 1 over n squared. Then over here, 54 over 2 gives us 27. And n squared over n squared cancels. We have 1 plus 1 over n. OK, I think we're good to go now because we can pull out the uh, constants 81 over 4. And we can pull out minus 27. Notice the limit of 1 over n as n goes to infinity is 0. So these two terms become 0 plus 1. So this becomes just 81 over 4 times 1 minus 27 times 1 when we take the limit. Okay, and this is minus 27 over 4. So it's minus 6.75. If we look at our estimate, looks like our estimate was uh, not too great. It was off by quite a lot, but at the same time, you know, when we take a limit as you go towards infinity, you get a much, much, much better, well, you get the exact area. So you get a much better value than if you just stop at six rectangles. But look how much more work it is. For now, we're going to find better ways of evaluating these integrals later. Let's set up an expression for the integral of e to the x dx from 1 to 3 as a limit of sums. So in this case, f of x is e to the x, a is 1 b is 3, and delta x is b minus a over n. So that's 2 over n. 3 minus 1 is 2. OK, so we've got x0 as 1. We've got x1 as 1 plus 2 over n, x0 plus 1 delta x. And we've got x2. 2 as 1 plus 4 over n, x3 as 1 plus 6 over n. I think that's enough to show us the pattern at this point. You can see that in general, xi is going to be 1 plus 2i over n. So now we can write that the integral of e to the x dx from 1 to 3 is equal to the limit of the sum from i equals 1 to n of f of x i delta x, and that's the limit of the sum of f of, well, we said x i is 1 plus 2 i over n. And then delta x we said is 2 over n. So now all we have to do is just plug in for what, um, f is. We pull out the 2 over n because it's constant with respect to this sum because it doesn't depend on i. And when we plug in for f, we see that uh, it's e to the 1 plus 2i over n because f was e to the x. Okay, let's use a computer algebra system to evaluate the expression. 
So we, we want to evaluate the limit of 2 over n times the sum of e to the 1 plus 2i over n from i equals 1 to n. So we need a computer algebra system, so how about we use Wolfram Alpha? We'll go and we'll plug in the sum e to the 1 plus 2i over n from i equals 1 to n. Okay, and we see that it's that. Let's see if I can grab that. Neat. So if that's our sum, let's take a limit of that. So we'll take the limit of 2 over n times the sum. as n goes to infinity. All right, let's grab that too. Okay, handy. Notice it shows that it's e cubed minus e. That's if we distribute, so let's write it like that. Make this a little bigger. And we'll make that a little bigger. So this limit, using our calculator, is equal to e cubed minus e. Let's evaluate the following integrals by interpreting each in terms of areas. Notice in our previous example, e to the uh, x from 0 to 3 is positive. So that means that this wasn't a signed area, this was the actual area underneath the curve. So in general, if we have something like this, which is also positive from 0 to 1, then we can figure out its integral just by interpreting it as an area. So let's draw it. Well, hmm. here's 0, here's x, here's y. But what exactly are we drawing? Well, y, let's say, is equal to square root of 1 minus x squared. So y squared is equal to 1 minus x squared. Oh, so this is just a circle in disguise x squared plus y squared equals 1. However, we only do the circle from 0 to 1, and it was strictly the positive square root, so we only do it above the x-axis. So we just draw a quarter circle. So this is y equals square root of 1 minus x squared, which is the same thing as the circle x squared plus y squared equals 1, but only in the first quadrant. So the area of this is the integral. So the integral of the square root of 1 minus x squared dx from 0 to 1 is equal to 1 fourth of the area of a circle. So it's 1 fourth of pi r squared. The radius is 1, so it's pi times 1 squared. So it's just pi over 4. For this example, let's try doing this again. This one's a little bit easier to draw right off the bat because it's just a linear function. So drawing x minus 1 means we start at minus 1 and then we go up. So it intersects over here at 1, here's minus 1, 0, x-axis, y-axis, and then we only go up until 3 because we're integrating from 0 to 3. So we'll stop over here at 3. So this point is 
3 comma 2. Because if you plug in 3, you get 3 minus 1 for y. And this is y equals x minus 1. Our integral, in this case, can't be the area because we have some part where our function dips under the curve. So instead, we have to interpret it as a net area of a1 minus a2. So a1 is the positive area. A2 is our negative underneath. So we get that it's going to be the area of the A1 triangle, which is half of base times height. So it's 3 minus 1 is 2, 2 up in the air. So it's half of 2 times 2 minus half of the other triangle that's underneath the curve. So that's half of 1 times 1. So our integral is equal to 1.5. For our next theorem, the integral is approximately equal to the uh, Riemann sum of f of xi bar delta x, where xi bar is the midpoint. It's half of the sum of each of the endpoints. So in this case, we're letting xi star, the sample point, be a midpoint. And we're using this new notation with a bar on the top to indicate that the particular sample point we're choosing is a midpoint. So now we have a new way of referring to the midpoint specifically. Bar is typically used um, as an average. So it's a good notation for us. Let's do an example of the midpoint rule. Say uh, delta x is equal to, well, we've got one to two. So b minus a, that's two minus one. And then we're doing n equals 5, so divide by 5, so 1 fifth. Let's see if we can figure out what our intervals are. The first one starts at 1 and then goes to 1.2 because it goes 1 fifth along. The next one starts at 1.2, goes to 1.4, then 1.4 to 1.6, 1 1.6 to 1.8 and then 1.8 to 2. So this tells us that our midpoints, x1 bar, is 1.1, x2 x bar is 1.3, x3 bar is 1.5, x4 bar is 1.7, and x5 bar is 1.9. We just went into the middle of each of these intervals. So our integral of 1 over x dx is approximately equal to delta x factored out times each of the y values, f of 1 plus 1 plus f of 1.3 plus f of 1.5 plus f of 1.7 plus f of 1.9. So that's 1 fifth times 1 over 1.1 1 .1 plus 1 over 1.3 1 plus 1 over 1.5 1 plus 1 over 1.7 1 plus 1 over 1.9, 1 which is about 0 0.691908. Notice that this midpoint rule saying that it's approximately equal to this sum is the exact same thing as saying that it's approximately equal to, say, a right sum, in which case we wouldn't have used bar, we would have just done xi, or left sum, in which case we could have just started at zero and used xi, or that the midpoint rule, if you would take the limit and put that over here, then this approximation would become an equality. And that limit, because remember, the sample points don't matter where we choose them. But without the limit, it's just an approximation for the integral. It doesn't give you the exact value. Next up, we have some properties of the definite integral. Notice that we've been assuming that a is smaller than b when we do our integrals, so that we have 
an interval that looks like this, and then we integrate from that x interval. However, there is no reason that a has to be smaller than b. It could be that um, the reverse is true, and we could end up integrating in the other way. So if we want to switch and have b first and then a, we just have to put a minus sign there, which should make sense because if you have uh, delta x equal to b minus a over n, then delta x switches and becomes a minus b over n, which is just negative times b minus a over n. So that negative gets put over there because it can be taken out of the limit and out of the sum. It should make sense also that if you go from a to a, so then you just, let's say a is over here, you just have a rectangle with no width. So you're multiplying a rectangle with delta x zero times height, doesn't matter what it is, you're gonna end up with zero. Similarly, if you have uh, some constant value, like y equals c, and then, well, let's put it over here, and then you integrate from some x value a to some x value b, then the height literally is always c, the width is just b minus a, you can get the area just by doing a single rectangle. So it's just the height c times b minus a. For our next one, it should, it should make sense because the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits, and the sum of a sum is the sum of the sums, right? Sum of a plus b is sum of a plus sum of b. So using those two facts, we get that the sum of the integrals is the integral of a sum. We also get that you can pull out constant because you can pull out constants from limits and sums. We get the same thing for differences. And we get that if you integrate from a to c, you stop somewhere and then you keep going. That's the same as if you went straight from a to b. So that's if I have some function and I integrate from A, I stop along C, and then I keep going to B. It should make sense that you just have to add this plus this, but it's not so much the easiest thing to prove. All of these formulas, uh, all of these properties are pretty intuitive, even if some of them are easier to prove than others. Let's use the properties of integrals to evaluate the integral of 4 plus 3x squared dx from 0 to 1. So let's see if we can split this up using our properties. Well, it's the integral from 0 to 1 of 4 dx, because the integral of a sum is sum of integrals, and 3x squared dx. Then we still have the integral from 0 to 1 4 dx, but we have 3 times x squared, so we can pull out that 3, because it's constant. Okay, we know that the integral from 0 to 1 of a constant is just b minus a times that constant. That was this property. So we pull out the constant, we multiply it by b minus a, and we get that that integral just becomes 4. We did in the previous section, uh, in example number 2 in section 5.1, the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared dx, we took the limit and we saw that that was 1 third. So I think we have enough now. We could say the integral from 0 to 1 of 4 plus 3 x squared dx is equal to the integral of 4 dx plus 3 times the integral of x squared dx, and now we can plug in 4 plus 3 times 1 third, and that's just 5. Let's do another example. If it is known that the integral from 0 to 10 is of f of x dx is 17, the integral from 0 to 8 is 12, let's find the integral from 8 to 10. So the integral from 0 to 8 
plus the integral from 8 to 10 should equal the integral from 0 to 10. doesn't matter if we stop somewhere in, in the middle. We just add up the next part. So that means that we want to know this one. So let's solve for that integral. We'll just subtract this integral from both sides. So we get that the integral from 8 to 10 of f of x dx is equal to the integral from 0 to 10 minus the integral from 0 to 8. So that's just 17 minus 12 because they gave us those values. So it's 5. For our last few properties, we have comparison properties of the integral. If our function is positive for our limits of integration, then the integral will be positive, which should make sense because if the function is positive, then we get a positive area. If one function is bigger than another function, then we have one integral bigger than another integral. That should also make sense. If I've got one function g and then another bigger function f and I'm integrating, then it makes sense I've got a bigger area under f than I do under g. We also have that if f is sandwiched between a maximum value and a minimum value, then the integral is also sandwiched between a maximum value and a minimum value. But the maximum value becomes the maximum times b minus a, and the other one becomes the minimum times b minus a. Let's do an example of that property to estimate an integral. We'll estimate e to the minus x squared dx from 0 to 1. So in this case, the maximum value, m, is the function evaluated at 0 because this thing is going down the entire time. e to the minus x squared is a decreasing positive function. So it's at its highest at the start, and then it just keeps on getting smaller and smaller. So plugging in 0, we see that e to the 0 is 1. Our minimum value, because it keeps getting smaller and smaller the entire time, will be at the end. So that'll be f of 1. Plugging that in, we get e to the minus 1. So let's use our property. We have e to the minus 1, our minimum, times b minus a, 1 minus 0, will be less than or equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of e to the minus x squared dx. And that's less than or equal to our maximum 1 times b minus a. So that just becomes e to the minus 1 less than or equal to the integral e to the minus x squared dx less than or equal to 1. We know that e to the minus 1, if we use a calculator, is approximately 0.3679. So we can actually get uh, an estimate here using a decimal if we round um, down a little bit to be on the safe side. 0.367 is definitely going to be less than or equal to integral from 0 to 1 e to the minus x squared dx. This is not um, the best estimate in the world because there's like a range of values here. You can see this if you take a look at the graph. So here's the decreasing function and then we'll have to draw um, our, how about our maximum? So that's y equals 1. And our minimum, that's y equals 1 over e. And then here is 1. So notice that we want the area underneath this curve. So we say that it's got to be more than this, which of course makes sense. And it's got to be less than the area of the entire uh, square, which is that. So not the best estimate in the world, but it's still nice to be able to do this for functions that are very difficult to integrate.